Welcome to Middle East Dialogues, a series of conversations with leading scholars and writers produced by the University of Denver's Center for Middle East Studies. Your host for this episode is Nader Hashemi, the director of the center and an associate professor at the University of Denver's Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. Our guest for this episode is Roger Cohen. Cohen has worked for the New York Times for 25 years as a foreign correspondent, foreign editor, and now columnist. His books include Hearts Grown Brutal, Sagas of Sarajevo, and The Girl from Human Street, A Jewish Family Odyssey. Uh, Roger, it's a huge honor to have you on our campus. Um, Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. Now. I want to chat with you about just the state of our world. You yeah. know, you've been writing eloquently and passionately about the attack in Paris and yeah. really what it means right. and what the appropriate response should be. And you wrote recently that the West, post Iraq, has lost its capacity for rage yeah. and that this is dangerous. Mm-hmm. What did you mean by that? Well, I think we're living in a very uneasy moment in the world. Uh, the whole unraveling of Syria has produced a great deal of instability, as well as uh, the phenomenon of ISIS. Mm -hmm. Um, This um, black flagged movement bent on the destruction of Western civilization. And at the time of 9-11, there was no doubt in the minds of the West, of the United States, that for Al-Qaeda to have a sanctuary Mm -hmm. uh, in Afghanistan um, from which it could plan such attacks was unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And um, we went in militarily and that sanctuary was removed. Then came the mistake of Iraq. Um, Now, 14 years later, we have ISIS after bringing down a Russian plane, the attack in Paris, 130 people dead, attack in San Bernardino, California, worst terrorist attack since Mm 9-11. The West seems to regard it as acceptable that ISIS should control territory on which six million people roughly live, uh, where they can raise oil revenue, Mm -hmm. where they can train, where they can plan, and above all say by holding this territory that um, they are a powerful and magnetic force drawing adherents from around the world. And um, I understand after Afghanistan, after Iraq, Mm -hmm. that the will to put boots on the ground uh, is much diminished. And President Obama is determined not to do that. I think that's a very big risk. Um, You can be sure of one thing, that on this territory they control, uh, ISIS is working on chemical weapons, working on weapons of mass destruction, Mm -hmm. working on ways to make Paris seem like a relatively minor incident. And uh, that's what I mean by losing the capacity for rage, uh, losing the capacity to draw a line. Mm -hmm. So the question is, and you've made this point that, you know, it's not enough to say, as the Obama administration has up to now, that ISIS will be defeated. These words lack meaning without a corresponding plan. So what's the effective and sort of reasonable plan that can not only you know, win the war against ISIS, but really win the peace? Well, it's very difficult. It's an agonizing choice. I'm not belittling uh, the difficulty of finding um, a means to not only defeat ISIS, which I don't think would be very difficult militarily. I Mm -hmm. think they're effective terrorists. There's nothing to suggest that they're good soldiers. Um, But then what do you do? Uh, But you have to weigh that difficult question Mm -hmm. against the difficult question that I just posed of whether it is acceptable to say, okay, we're going to wait another six months for the air campaign to work or until we found a pretty effective Kurdish proxy Mm -hmm. and the Kurds have taken back a little territory from ISIS. We have not found a Sunni proxy. Mm -hmm. We don't have a Sunni proxy. We don't have an immediate prospect of any. Yes, we can try and close the Turkish border. That would be the Turkish border with ISIS land, that would be uh, an effective measure, I think. So it's a question of um, weighing um, 
whether the difficulty <coughs> of finding where you go after retaking this territory, if right. you do that, um, is uh, a reason to do just continue with the current policy. Um, I argue that uh, it's not it's not sufficient. I mean, just to say uh, we don't know where we would go from there right. uh, is not the risk is too great in right. my view. So you were disappointed, I'm reading in your comments now with President Obama's speech on Sunday where basically it was stay the course. Did you see anything of value in there or um, am I right to read your, your comments? Well, I've seen, I've seen plenty of value in the president saying that uh, we must resist Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. Yes, we must. We must not try and keep Syrian refugees out of this country. Of course, there has to be screening. Right. I found merit in that. I thought the president was much better uh, from the Oval Office than he was from Turkey um, in the immediate aftermath of the mm. Paris attacks, where his whole body language and his actual language um, suggested that, well, Paris happened. Uh, we've got a good strategy. Uh, what ISIS wants is us for us to go to war with them. Yeah. And I've seen that argument a lot, you know, that ISIS wants a kind of end of days mm -hmm. moment, wants to draw us in. Right. Uh, but just because ISIS wants something yeah. doesn't mean necessarily yeah. that our doing that right. is a mistake, right. at, at least in my view. Um, so I thought the president was... Um, better, but on the whole, pretty unpersuasive. And I think one of the problems with domestic US politics right now is that the feeling that in response to these three consecutive attacks in quick succession, uh, there is no sense that the United States, still the leader of the free world, has upped the ante, mm -hmm. has upped the ante for, for ISIS. That leaves a big space for all these expressions of anger uh, on, on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. Um, now, this is an appropriate time to sort of draw comparisons with another moment in time that you covered and wrote about quite eloquently, and that is the war in the Balkans, particularly in Bosnia. Yeah. Um, it seemed like, um, at least to me, we're going through similar moments and similar sort of crises with respect to U.S. leadership and a global response to a horrific conflict that um, has simply been allowed to play itself out, and all of us are paying the price for it. So in the case of Bosnia, you know, for the first three years of the conflict, everyone was just watching this slow motion genocide take mm -hmm. place. No one was doing anything. And similar arguments were being advanced. There's no vital American national interest. Mm -hmm. Doesn't affect us. Mm -hmm. Let it play itself out. Then you had Srebrenica. Mm -hmm. And then President Clinton, to his mm -hmm. credit, mm -hmm. reversed course. Mm -hmm. He appointed Richard Holbrook. Mm -hmm. Richard Holbrook went around to the various capitals and provided a solution that was both military and political. Mm -hmm. It put an end, it was an ideal solution, mm. Dayton, but at least it put an end to a mm. conflict that was tearing at least a section of Southeastern mm. Europe apart. And this sort of strikes me as being uh, very similar, not identically, but to what's happening in Syria. You know, another mm. carnage, mm. you know, not genocidal, but perhaps borderline genocidal if you read the human rights documentation, mm. war crimes, crimes against humanity, overwhelmingly at the Well, hands. genocide against the Yazidis. Genocide the against States. the Yazidis. But then again, yeah. in this case, the difference is Despite Paris, despite genocide, mm. despite all that we're seeing, no commensurate mm. American leadership to say, look, mm. enough well, is look, enough. Is that a fair either, parallel? You know, I, um, up to a point, although I think uh, the Islamic State is a direct threat to the security values and civilization of the West in, the way, in a way that the Bosnian War uh, was not. Mm. And I think for Vice President Biden to say, as he did after Paris, that the Islamic State is not an existential threat to our societies and that nothing that the Islamic State can do can threaten our societies, our values, our civilization, our fundamental way of living. Well, nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Yeah. I think that's a very dangerous thing to yeah. say and especially after uh, San Bernardino. Mm -hmm. I, this was said before mm -hmm. San Bernardino. Now look, I covered the Bosnian War. I sat in Sarajevo week after week, month mm -hmm. after month, writing about what was happening in Sarajevo and elsewhere in Bosnia, seeing pregnant women being blown up from the shelling from the Serbs on the mm. hillsides, uh, seeing this affront in Europe, mm. and this three years after um, the Muslims of Western, Northern, and Eastern Bosnia had been herded into mm. 
concentration camps, not death factories, but concentration camps, mm -hmm. and been expelled. And this was allowed to go on for a long time. And then I saw the effectiveness of interventionism, mm. of an intervention that was military, a few days of bombing, mm. uh, backed by strong diplomacy led by Richard Holbrook. And it brought the war to an end. Mm. And subsequently in Kosovo, uh, the Western intervention led to the departure of Slobodan Milosevic, the Serbian strongman who had been behind all these horrors. So, uh, of course, it had an effect on me. Mm. Um, I believe that the United States um, can make a difference, can be a force for good, that American power can change situations mm. in a positive way. Uh, and one can talk about Bosnia, one can talk about Kosovo, before mm. that one can talk about Germany, one can mm. talk about Japan, uh, post-war. Uh, there are many examples um, of the beneficent influence right. of the United States and of American power. But that position these days, um, after Afghanistan, uh, after Iraq, um, is much criticized. Mm. And uh, all I can say is that if interventionism in its Iraqi form proved a disaster, uh, and we don't need to enumerate all the mm -hmm. mistakes that were made, including the very reasons given for going to war there, um, non-interventionism in mm. its Syrian form mm. has, I think, proved at this point equally disastrous. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have a quarter of a million people dead. Mm. You have several million people displaced. You have Syrian refugees seeping uh, into Europe. Mm. Um, and you have in the vacuum, nobody loves a vacuum like a jihadi. Mm. And um, you've seen the formation in fairly rapid order of um, this new threat uh, to the West in, for, in the form of uh, the Islamic State of this jihadi movement with its medievalist reading mm -hmm. uh, of certain verses of the Quran, which has um, used that reading, uh, or in applying that reading, has enslaved women, children. Um, I spoke about the Yazidis, um, perpetrated uh, these acts in uh, Sharm Sheikh, mm. in Paris, in California. Um, and I think um, the threat is um, unlike any that I've, I've seen. Yeah. So um, with a year left in Obama's presidency, yeah. you know, you've spoken in times past and written very supportively generally of President Obama. But um, what is going to be his legacy as president? I mean, what, 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 what sort of do you think historians are going to write about? His, his, his legacy, both the, the positive and the negative? Well, I don't know if you're just talking about foreign policy well, or foreign, domestic. Well, well, let, I mean, I, I think, the pre policy, I think yeah. President Obama has been a good president. Yeah. Um, I think he's definitely uh, among the good presidents that the United States has had, mm -hmm. after one of the worst presidents that the United States has had. Um, and, uh, you know, health care and the rebuilding of the economy mm -hmm. domestically have been uh, signal achievements. I also consider his courage in uh, reaching the Iran nuclear deal mm. uh, in the face of tremendous opposition uh, mm. from the Congress, um, uh, enormous hostility from the Republican Party. Not one Republican, not one, mm. could see any merit mm. in a deal that turned around a situation in which Iran had gone over the last decade from 200 centrifuges to 20,000. And suddenly, through diplomacy, mm. tough diplomacy, uh, led by Bill Burns, uh, this was put into reverse. Right. And Iran began dramatically reducing the number of centrifuges and committed um, to ring fencing uh, its nuclear capacity for a period of 15 years, uh, keeping Iran from a bomb for that period and condemning mm. the United States and Iran to a relationship mm. over that period mm. after decades, decades of complete estrangement. Mm -hmm. Iran is not going away. It's right. a 5,000 year old civilization. It's a big country yeah. sitting right in the middle of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And we, the United States, had no relationship mm. with it. We take for granted now mm. that Secretary of State Kerry uh, talks to Foreign Minister Zarif mm. on a regular basis. Mm. This is a good thing. That's not to say that I'm betting on over this 15 year period, 
uh, the Iranian regime um, necessarily changing mm -hmm. in what in a positive direction, but I think the chances are increased by contact with the world mm -hmm. uh, rather than the opposite of that. So certainly that is a major achievement mm -hmm. uh, in my view for President Obama. Um, I think the major blemish mm -hmm. uh, will be Syria. Right. Um, it's getting on for five years now. Yeah. I think there were a couple of signal mistakes. Uh, one was to say that President Bashar al-Assad was going. He was leaving. Mm. He was finished. It was over. Without any coherent plan whatsoever to achieve that objective. I don't think a President of the United States can say something like that without seriously compromising mm -hmm. American credibility. Mm -hmm. And I still believe that it is American credibility, the credibility of our treaties, the credibility of our red lines, mm -hmm. the credibility of Article 5 of both the NATO Treaty and the Treaty with Japan that underwrites global security. And when that credibility is compromised, it is no small thing. It is a serious thing. And I think equally, two years later, yeah. when he set a red line against the use yeah. of chemical weapons in Syria, that was infringed by President Assad. French planes were ready to go. They were revving up. Uh, the president sent the Secretary of State out to make an eloquent case mm. for why there had to be a military riposte upholding the red line. And then, as we all know, uh, he went for a walk uh, in the Rose Garden, and that was the end of that. Yeah. And people take note. Yeah. President Putin took note. Mm. Other powers around the world took note. And uh, Syria, essentially, is a free-for-all right now. Mm. Uh, there's a Sunni... Shia schism in the Middle East, it's playing out uh, most intensely in mm. the war in Syria and of course the war also in Yemen. Um, the Russians are present on mm. the ground, uh, Bashar al-Assad, the Kurds, uh, the Islamic State, mm. and nobody thinks, nobody thinks that the United States has a handle on the situation. Mm -hmm. It's kind of taken for granted. So to me Syria is the graveyard of a couple of things. It's the graveyard of the Arab awakening, mm. in which I personally placed great hope. And, um, and it's the graveyard, in a sense, of a certain world order. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's the most uh, 